Good morning and welcome to Tracy Tin United Methodist Church, our worship service. Wow, we have in-person worship this morning, and they're still coming in. Yeah, clap, go ahead. This is Pentecost Sunday, which is the birth of the church way back when, and it's the rebirth of the church starting today, because we can gather indoors. Uh, you know, I just want to lay out a couple of things because it's going to be different and because we're still broadcasting live. This is going out live. You're, if, if you speak up, they're going to hear you and you know, in, in probably in Italy and France because <laughs> this thing goes all over the world. So, uh, so be, be, be aware of that. And then if you'll notice, I'll be kind of focusing this way, but I promise you I will make eye contact with all of you because I love you all. This is an exciting day. I'm glad that we're gathered together to worship God in spirit and truth. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Good morning and welcome to Tristan United Methodist Church. Today is Sunday, May 23rd, which is Pentecost Sunday, as Pastor Ed just said. Welcome, everyone. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. God on high, we gather. We gather. Having overcome a pandemic that kept us apart, we gather with confidence that we hear your call to do no harm. We gather this day of Pentecost to worship and hear your breath of life. We gather to feel like the waterfall on our backs, the Spirit poured into our souls. We gather to praise your holy name. 
Each of us may choose a different way to say your, to say your praise, yet our hearts sing the same song. We gather in love for one another, and each in one of us, in love in you. Fill our morning with your word. Light a fire in us that spills out over the rest of the week. Penetrate our stubborn will with your grace upon your, our life. Through the name of your risen Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. And now for the prayer of illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Amen. Good morning. This morning's uh, reading is found in Acts 2, 1 through 21. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them the ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea, all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The, the sun <coughs> shall return to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great glorious day, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall <coughs> be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Uh, we read in Psalms 104, 24 to 34, 35b, that the Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Yonder is the sea, great and wide. Creeping things innumerable are there, living both small and great. There go the ships, Leviathan, that you formed to to sport in it. These all look to you to give them their food in new season. When you give to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are filled with good things. When you hide your face, they are dismayed. 
and when you take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. When you send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face on the ground. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. Who looks on the earth and it trembles? Who touches the mountains and they smoke? I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have being. May the meditation be pleasing to him, for I rejoice in the Lord. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. And the New Testament reading is found in Romans 8, 22 through 27. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we await for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we are saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that every spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows that it is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. This is the word of the Lord. The glory of Patri, Gloria, glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Thank you, Anna. I think it's okay if we stand for the gospel lesson. Let's stand. Now, <clears throat> throughout church history, from the very first century and second century, they, people would stand for the gospel. That was just a tradition. And there's a theological reason for that, but I think there's also a practical reason. And the practical reason is that the mind can only absorb as much as the seat can endure. <laughs> the Holy Gospel according to John. When the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who comes from the Father, will testify about me, says Jesus. You are also witnesses and you will testify, because you have been with me from the beginning. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. And when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak of his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and will be declared to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, says Jesus, because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. In our first reading this morning from the book of Acts, which is about the Pentecost, there are very, two very important questions that are raised. And I'm going to consider these questions going through what I want to share this morning. The first question is, what does this mean? Of course, they're asking about hearing all these people in their own language. There's some kind of a miracle or something's going on here. They don't, don't understand what's going on. It'd be like Moses uh, in confronting the bush that is on fire that's not being consumed. It's like he said, I got to go check this out. What's going on? What does this mean? What does this mean? So what does Pentecost mean? That's an important question. And what is the relevance to you and me today? 
And then the second question that follows the answer to that question, which I hope I can answer, uh, the question then becomes, what do I do? What ought we to do? Now the word ought is not a should. An ought, an ought word is an ethical imperative. What ought we to do because of the meaning of Pentecost? So let's try to navigate that a little bit. So I don't know if you know the word Pentecost. It just means 50. It all means 50. And the reason uh, the Jews would celebrate the day of Pentecost, you see, when they gathered together in Jerusalem that day, they weren't coming as Christians. It's a Jewish holiday. It's a Jewish celebration. It's a reason for the people of the known world who are Jews to be in Jerusalem to worship God. And what are they celebrating? Well, they're celebrating three things, but I just want to mention one. They're celebrating the giving of the law from God to Moses up in the mountain. Now, why is that significant? Because when you go back to the Old Testament, you realize that when the Passover night, the angel of death came, killing every firstborn, so that the Jews could escape from their slavery and be set free so they could go out and worship God. From that day until the day that God gave the law in the mountain is 50 days. So they would celebrate on the 50th day Pentecost, which was God has given us the oughtness. What ought we to do? What does the law say? The law says to love God. The law says to love yourself, love your neighbor as yourself. There are two fundamental commandments, the Ten Commandments that are trying to articulate. The first four have to do with our love for God, and the last six have to do with our love for each other. That's that's what's happening. So they gather together in Jerusalem on that day, but on that day, which is exactly 50 days after Jesus was crucified, you remember Paul said, Behold the Lamb of God, not John said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But Jesus, Paul says, is our Passover Lamb. Therefore, let us keep the feast. What's the feast? The feast is Pentecost. Fifty days after Jesus was crucified, buried, until the day of Pentecost, which Moses gave the law, but now it's different. Here's the difference. God's going to take that same law, except it's not going to be on tablets of stone. He wants to imprint that law within our minds and in our hearts. So when the Spirit comes to dwell among us, and with us, he's simply revealing God's intention for us to keep the commandment, which is to love God with our whole, our mind, our body, our strength, to love our neighbor as ourselves. That goes all the way back to Leviticus. That's what Pentecost is. So yes, it is the birth of the church, because on that day, 5,000 of those people that gathered in Jerusalem became Christians. They converted to Christianity. And it's not a conversion like we think of conversion. Well, uh, I was a Lutheran and now I'm Episcopalian, or I was Catholic and now I'm a Protestant. That's not conversion. Conversion is the change of mind and heart. From the law being external to the law being now internalized. And the Spirit comes to infuse in us the very attributes of God's nature. And God's nature is what? If you were to sum it up in one word, it's love. Now, that's the easy part. See, that, what, you know, when they say, what does this mean? Well, that's what it means. Okay? What ought, what ought I to do? Because this is the tough part. Because understanding what it means is one thing, but to actually live it on a daily basis is quite another. And I don't know about you, but I know about me, it's a struggle. Because there's some people out there I just don't like. Right? There are people that rub me the wrong way. There are things that are going on in my life that sometimes I question my own salvation, I question my own Christianity. And sometimes I'll get so angry at someone, I'll say, you know what, I'm about to lose my Christianity. <laughs> right. 
Uh, don't we all do that? I mean, that's just part of it. So it's, we're not about being perfect. It's about sanctification. And that's the second aspect of Pentecost. Paul said it this way. May the Spirit of God come to sanctify your body, your soul, and your spirit. Now the word sanctify means a lot of crazy things to a lot of people. But I want to read something from Thomas Merton that I think uh, describes uh, what sanctification really is about. That is if I have it. Yeah, I got it. It's in here somewhere. Trust me. <laughs> well, I thought I had it. Well, here we go. Uh, this goes back to what I started last week about God's got to do something in us, transform our minds and our hearts. So Thomas Merton says this. If you don't know who Thomas Merton is, he's a, a sociistic uh, monk who actually bridged the gap between uh, the East and West. He, he started the dialogue between East and West. He's written so many books. The most famous is the Seven Mountain uh, Experience, where he, he talks about his own journey of development. It's a wonderful story. Most of us can relate to it. But he says this. It is true to say that for me, sancti sanctify, sanctification, consists in being myself. And for you, sanctity <coughs> consists in being yourself. Moreover, he goes on to say, in the last analysis, your sanctity will never be mine, and mine will never be yours, except in the communion of love and grace. And then finally, he goes on to say, for me to be a saint means to be myself. For you to be a saint means to be yourself. And salvation is the fact that the problem of finding out who I am and discovering my true self. That's Thomas Merton. So in my analogy of baseball, first base, second base, and third base, we cover first base and second base, so I just want to just briefly go through that again. In first base, that stage of development is God doing something in us. What is he doing in us? God is revealed. What did, what did God do through Jesus? He revealed the true God. Right? He reveals who God is. So what the Spirit does in our baptism, or baptism of the Spirit, or in the Pentecostal experience, is he's revealing to you your true self. That's what it means to be in the Spirit. That's what it means to be in the boat. Now, having said that, we should raise the question, well, if there's a true self, then maybe there's a false self. And I can tell you what my false self is. My false self is I'm a fighter, I'm a scrambler, I will claw, scratch, itch to get what I want done. I will break through the mountain, I don't need to climb it, I'll smash it down. That's my false self, because that's a that's a lie. You ever try to smash a mountain down? It doesn't work. Let me tell you how many times I've tried and how many times I've failed. It just does not work. So that's my false self. That's a false notion of who God is. It's a false notion of who I am. It's a false notion of who you are. That's the condition in which we are born. So God has to do something in us to convert our mind and our heart from our false self, which is always going to be with us. You never get rid of it entirely. Don't kid yourself. It's always going to be lurking. It's, in, in psychological terms, it's called the shadow. It's like saying, I don't want to have a shadow. A shadow. And it's always going to be with me. The key is, here's the key. When you're talking about sanctification, you're not talking about sanctifying from something like I'm going to separate myself from my shadow and to get rid of my oh wait a minute it's following me get out of here I don't, it, right there it is it just is going to come with me now what it means is not trying to separate yourself from your shadow but rather to face the sun when you face the sun what happens the shadow is behind you you're not walking into the shadow it is behind you I think that's what Paul meant when he 
He says, get thee behind me, Satan. Because I'm not going to walk in that. I'm going to aim for life. And whatever God needs to do in my life, I give God consent and permission. Transform me, melt me, mold me, shape me. Create in me a true heart. Create in me a heart that's pure. Create in me the kind of love by which you love other people. Even though I struggle because of all the pain and suffering, hurt, betrayal that I have experienced in my life that kind of messes everything up. I gotta work through those things by grace, not by strong will, not by knocking down mountains, but Lord, by your grace. By your grace. By your grace. That's first base. Second base, let me just touch on this just a little bit before I get to third base, which is where I'm really going. On second base, that, that part of our development is how to live in relationships with one another. So it's not God doing something in us, but now God's, God goes, hmm, I got a motley crew down there. How am I going to get shape them up so that they somehow can relate to each other in a way that advances the gospel, in a way that moves us in the right direction? Now, how am I going to do that? So that's what God is doing with us by the Spirit. He is, he's creating us to be relational people. What does that mean? That means, uh, I've been in ministry for 45 years, and I, and I have to say, that a great part of that, those years, was involved in institutional, what I call institutional language. And we got to move from that to relational language. We have to move toward understanding that everything is about our relationship, our relationship with God, our relationship with ourselves, our relationship with our, our significant people in our lives, and our relationship with others. And how do we do that? We do that by listening. I call it redemptive listening. Something I have to work on every day. I am. You know, she calls it, you don't have redemptive listening, you have selective listening. And I'm guilty. I'm guilty. I hear what I want to hear. I see what I want to see. I do what I want to do. And I don't regard other people's feelings sometimes. So I have to learn to be a, a, a redemptive presence and to be a redemptive listening so that there's real communication, so that there's communion. See, communion? It's not just about coming up here. This is, a, this is symbolic of what we desire. What we desire is to be one with God, one with each other, one in ministry into the whole world. That's what we say in, the, in our prayer. So that's, that's the desire I have to have. I have to cultivate that desire. And if I cultivate that desire, I am becoming what I am consuming. I am becoming the body of Christ. When you receive, so, you know, when I used to hand you the bread, I used to say, I didn't say, I didn't say, the body, this is the body of Christ. I would say, I just simply say body of Christ. What I'm looking, I look you right in the eye and I say, body of Christ, because you are the body of Christ. And this act that you're doing is saying, I am giving consent to be in relationship with everyone in this room or the people I worship with. I'm giving consent. And that means give a little, take a little, compromise, communicate, find the common ground, be willing to eat your words if you have to, to say I'm sorry when I make a mistake or if I say something inappropriate, I'm really sorry, help me, make me a better person. I say that all the time to him. You know, I, I, I say to her, you help me to be a better person by feeding back to me how I'm coming across to you. Yeah, that's how that works. That's what church is about. Church is a community. Church is about relationships. Now, it is true that the church has expanded in the ways that are beyond my imagination. Who would have thought two years ago that I would be broadcasting internationally? I never... I mean, the first time I did something like this, I, my kids said, oh, Pop, you got a lot of work to do. <laughs> to be honest, I was scared to death. And, and so it's, it's a learning. And so what I'm saying to you is that the, the community is no longer defined only by the neighborhood. Now it is the neighborhood, no, no question, I'm not saying that. But it's not only defined, it's not defined by the neighborhood. It's also defined 
by people who have a common experience. They like the people here, or whatever reason that motivates them to drive five, six, seven, eight, ten miles to be here, because there's a sense of connection. That connection is important to people. In fact, I think that's the number one thing that young people are looking for in the church, is to feel connected, to feel like they have influence with the people there. I think that's an important part of what it means to be a community. But now we have a third reality. And this is where we're navigating, because I don't know that we really understand all of that. And that is, we have a virtual community. What do I mean? This is a person from Indiana. Wrote me a letter. My friends Rich and Kathy Seeger thoughtfully and boldly have brought you and your congregation to the circle of prayer on our behalf. To know you have been praying is so comforting. I am so grateful and humbled to know that our God is hearing the prayers of many all across the country. And certainly you and your church have been an important part of my healing. March and April were quite a challenge physically. And, but May has, has me up and out and moving again. I'm still under the care of a great oncologist, but the great physician has given me more days. And not just an extension of days, a rich quality of living in those days is wonderful to have my head up, moving around through our community, working in our yard, life seems back to normal, and I am grateful, I'm a grateful man. Thank you for bringing me and my family before your congregation and in turn before the Lord, the great one, Mike. See, you are touching people all over the country. That was made possible because of this. And, and that's, that's part of the virtual community. So now, when we consider relationships, we have to consider not only my needs, our needs, but the needs of the world. We have to, as Wayne said, we, we live locally, but we got to think globally. And that's now becoming a reality. We have people in Italy that chime in, and people in France. We've been blocked out by Arab countries, though, however. <laughs> you know, you can't win them all. So, uh, so, so what I'm saying to you is that relationships are the cornerstone of building a church and, and the kind of love. I, I remember one of the, I think it was Caligia, one of the emperors that wrote in a journal somewhere. He said, I don't know about these Christians. I don't understand it, but he said, but here's what he said. But oh my, it's what the direct quote, oh my, how they love each other. Oh my, how they love each other. When my brother, younger brother, was looking for a church, he visited a lot of churches, and none of them appealed to him except for this one. And he said, he said, boy, I know God's in that place. That's why he said, I know, how do you know God's in that place? The way they love you, and the way they love each other. I know God is in that place. And that's the church he went to. I think people are looking to be loved, looking to be loved into being, looking to be set free rather than bondage that religion does and churches do so often, they want to be set free. They, they want to be their true self rather than someone telling them what that means. They're on a path of self-discovery and we're giving them permission to seek the Spirit to find yourself in that place. That's second base. Third base. So, Paul, or uh, the book of Acts says in chapter 1, verse 8, You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Samaria, Galilee, and the uttermost parts of the world. And what that is saying, essentially, what God is working through. So, God can't, believe me, believe me when I say this, God will not work through you. He can't work through you until he's done first base and second base. You, you got to get that. I mean, what will God, what will happen if you don't take care of business on first base and second base, you get to third base, you think you're at third base, and God's not really working through you, it's your own stuff working through you. When your own stuff works through you, that's not good for you and it's not good for them. 
So third base is about allowing the Spirit to express the love of God through you, by your outreach, by your witness, by your nurture. Those are the characteristics that God is expressing through you. And that's the difficult part. So how do we do that? How do we come to that? When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, what does that mean? It means I have to be open to receive. See, the Spirit is a gift. So, let's just say this is a gift. Okay, God has given us a gift. And God has given you a gift, Anna, right there it is. Now, what is she going to do with this gift? gift doesn't work until you open it up. And when you open it up, you can either go wow, or nope, going to cost me too much. I don't want to love that guy. I don't want to forgive. I don't want to act like God. I just like hating people. I just like being prejudiced. I really think my race is superior. I think there should only be one sexual orientation, period. Love everybody? Nope, can't do that. They gotta be just like me, or just like us. And we're against the world. And don't believe what they tell you in the world. And God is saying, the world's not telling you that, I am! And that happens. Because we become right in our own eyes. And Proverbs says, those who are right in their own eyes, that leads to death. Now death, in that sense, doesn't mean dying. It means separation. Death simply means separation. Death is when the spirit leaves the body. When the breath leaves the body. And when we are broken, our relationship, when we say, I don't want to be in relationship to African Americans, I don't want to talk about it, I don't want to be a part of it, I don't want to give Black Lives Matter, what does that mean? We fight all that, see? Instead, maybe God is raising something up that we ought to be paying attention to. And how can I be open? I may be uncomfortable. Oh, but the Spirit comes to do what? Bring comfort. And it doesn't make us, it doesn't mean just to make you feel comfortable. It means to stretch you. Stretch you in a way that your capacity for loving others is bigger and bigger and bigger. Because you've been comforted by the power of the Spirit working in you and with you and now through you. Through you. I'll close with this. I heard this when I was a young whippersnapper, probably about 19 years old. I was driving in a car, and it was a black preacher preaching on the radio. And I, I was not accustomed to anything like that, but I was fascinated by what he was saying. And the one thing he said is this, that really stuck with me. You gotta walk the walk, you just, and you gotta talk. You can't just talk the walk, you gotta walk the walk. And then he said, now, he said, if you expect God to do the impossible, you better take care of that which is possible. And if you don't take care of that which is possible, God's not obligated to do the impossible. You hear that? I think there's truth in that. That we have to do what is possible that sets God free in us, with us and through us, to do the impossible. To do the impossible. An example of that might be, I don't know this for a fact, but it could be that when Jesus multiplied the bread for everyone, and everyone looks at the miracle of Jesus multiplied bread, maybe what Jesus did is soften their hearts out there because all these guys, and what men, women, and children, they were hiding their bread underneath their cloak. I don't want anyone to know that I have this because I'm, I don't want to share it. I have to take care of my own. All you got to do is look at the news, uh, news, uh, the gas shortage down and everybody's just hoarding like crazy. Mine, mine, I gotta get mine, I gotta get mine, I gotta get mine. There's no consideration of how do I share? 
And so I think the miracle is not so much that he multiplied bread, as he softened their hearts and said, oh, I have five loaves and two fish. I can share a couple. And the other person, well, if you can share a couple, I can share a couple. And then pretty soon, everyone's being fed. But no one said, I worked hard for mine. And the only reason they don't have bread is they didn't think enough to go to work and get, they don't take responsibility. It was none of that. It was about taking care of each other. And people will see that because God is working through you. When God is working through you, you take care of each other and you take care of the world. Even if it's just praying for a family from afar who's dealing with cancer and is facing their own imminent death, that we care enough to pray, to take the time to pray, and they're not even a member of the church. That speaks to a universal cosmic Christ who loves every person. And we gather in this local place so that we can have influence not only here, we have influence in the community, now we have influence in the world. And you shall receive power when the Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. This is our Jerusalem, right here. You'll be my witnesses in Galilee, which is around here, and also in Samaria. You may not think anything about that, but when that says what I think of, that's the enemy. In those days, they were considered the enemy. They didn't like Samaritans. But Jesus said, you'll be my witnesses in Samaria. What does that mean? What do I have to do? And then, to the uttermost parts of the world. Right here, in this little place, you could be touching people throughout the world. If that doesn't excite you, I don't know what does. Because I get excited to know that what we do matters. It matters to people who are facing their own death. It matters to people who are suffering in the world that we're reaching out and we care and doing what we can do. We can't do everything. We don't have the resources. But we, what we can do, just like that little boy, uh, I have uh, two fish, two tiny pieces of fish and five loaves. Can you use that? Of course. That's all. You shall receive power. That's how you go. Yeah, I didn't even use all my notes. You're lucky. <laughs> I've been here till next Tuesday. <laughs> and you would have gone. In fact, I had I had one church that put a sign in the back that would go, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, we're leaving. <laughs> oh, thank God for good good humor, and I hope uh, this word can be sealed into your heart uh, so that uh, it will mean something for you as well. Uh, I think we're going to go to confession, right? Right. Yep. You got it. Go ahead. Let us pray. Gracious God, living eternal spirit, we thank you that you seek us in tender loving care. Let us be not lost. Help us in the same way to reach outward to those who may feel alienated or excluded from the Christian community. Send your spirit upon us when we speak the word of your love. People may hear and understand it in their own language at the first Pentecost day. Forgive our sins, Father of grace. Help us please you. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The Lord is slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. Let us change our hearts and minds by the power of the Holy Spirit who loves us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Now, as a forgiven and reconciled people, let us offer ourselves and our gifts to God. And we're going to actually going to pass the plate. So I'll let you handle that. One or two, I think two would work. <laughs>
God of abundance, we bring our humble gifts and offerings. May they be a blessing for those who are in need, for those who are hurting, for those that feel alone. May those blessings stretch beyond the monetary walls and be a conduit of your grace and your love for all of us. In the name of Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your heart. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Indeed, it's a joy and a good thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn saying, Holy, 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 holy Lord, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus, who lived and died that we might inherit your spirit. By the baptism of the suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church by the spirit. You delivered us from sin and slavery so that we could be free and set free to love, and made with a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, gave thanks to you, and he broke the bread, and gave the bread to his disciples and said, Take all of you, eat. This is my body, which will be given up for you. In the same manner, he took the cup and gave thanks to you. He blessed the cup. And gave the cup to his disciples and said, Take all of you, drink from this, for this is the sign of the new covenant, the shedding of blood for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living gift, in union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Hosanna in the highest. All right, here's the moment in our communion service when we invoke the coming of the Spirit. And often we think it's consecrating the elements. That's true. But more importantly, it's invoking the Holy Spirit to come on all of us. And if you just open yourself to that possibility, it's not an emotional thing, it's not a feeling. It is receiving the gift. Just say, Lord, I receive the gift. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, gathered, and on these gifts, all of us, that we might become the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood, that we too might receive the Spirit and be empowered to go forth he calls us to do the work of ministry. Through your Son, Jesus, with the Holy Spirit in your Holy Church, all honor and glory is your Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. <laughs> with the confidence of children of God, let us pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Happy are they who are called to his table. Lord, we are not worthy to receive you. Only say the word and we shall be healed. 
O Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. O Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. O Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, grant us your peace. Amen. I will take communion and then after the service you're welcome to these are consecrated elements. And if you have family, friends at home that you'd like to take a cup too, please feel free to take take and distribute them. It's kind of like sharing the bread. People may not understand what it is. They, they don't have to believe that it's the body of Christ. You're just sharing your love with them. The body and love of Christ given for us. Amen. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Touch us with your spirit. Ignite us with faith and power. Grant that we go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I love the, the, the prayer of the Holy Spirit, which is to simply say, Come Holy Spirit, uh, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in us the fire of your love. Fire us up. Fire us up with the kindle of your love. Oh, we've got a couple other things I want to do here. Uh, but before I do that, could someone bring Libby's picture here for me? We have uh, lost a dear, a dear saint this past week. Libby, our Libby, went home to be with the Lord. Her family is grieving. Thank God, Roger's here. He draws upon your strength, your love, to help him sustain through this time of loss and grief. Libby was a dear saint. She was on the staff parish when I first came. She's the first person I met in this church. The first person that welcomed me. And she would go with me in the beginning to visit different people in the church that she thought I should go and visit. And then she couldn't do that anymore. And began to deteriorate. It has been very hard on the family and on her. Because she was almost lost to you before she was lost. And that creates a vacuum. It creates pain. And we need to pull together for Roger and his family and at the loss that we feel. But I wanted you to see her face and I wanted you to know what she means to me. She will never be forgotten. Neither will you, Roger. No matter where I go or where I am, this is a star right there in the center that shines with me. We have lost some good saints this year. And I mentioned Bob Lukic. I will miss him. I remember the first time I preached here, he had his little chair that he just walked up and, and he sat down and he, he grabbed me like this, pulled me down, and he whispered to me and he said, you have refreshed my soul. <laughs> and others, I probably can't name them off the top of my head, but you know who they are and what they mean. We have lost some saints this year. It's always difficult. We also have some prayer concerns that I would like to lift up, and we will open it up for you if you have concerns as well. And for people that are linked into our Facebook, if they have concerns, they can also. And there's also an afterglow. We, there will be no fellowship. We, we can't do food. But you're welcome to come to an afterglow and discuss the sermon or whatever, and kind of interact with others in the group. Uh, a prayer request for a friend who's a teacher, has a fracture in her leg. Pray for her with two children and a husband at home. Pray for a friend as he tries to get healthy and awaits prompt operation. Also, the loss of his long-time rented home due to a sale. Please pray for a friend with multiple pains and hoping a doctor can help. And continued prayers for Rich and Rebecca in Indiana. And I read you the letter from, from Mike. 
and also we want to keep Roger and his family in our deepest prayer. Do you have prayer requests that you'd like to offer? Anyone out there, Brian, that... Uh, uh, nothing detected. Okay, all right. So, Lord, you've heard the prayers of your people spoken and unspoken in our hearts. Uh, this has been a very difficult year in so many ways for so many people. And now I pray that we can see a glimpse of the light that is before us. And as we aim for that light, may the sun shine upon us brightly so that we can rise above and once more return to a more normal life even if it's a new normal. Help us to navigate that new normal in a way that is glorifying to you and edifying to the body of Christ. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. So we're doing our refrigerator door. You know, we, we do this. Uh, uh, so I think it's okay. Sandy and Dennis, would you please come up here? Both of you. Oh, and then I see waited for Sandy. <laughs> True love. This is a certificate of uh, appreciation for all that you do and are doing. I don't know if you realize this, Sandy puts the worship plan together. She writes her own prayers. She puts it all together from her heart. It makes my life so easy. And I'm grateful for that and what you're doing with Mal and all of you. Dennis, I know you're a great support. You've helped so many people in the congregation with their issues. And, oh, wait a minute, there's two of them here. Give me one back. This is not two for the price of one, sorry. <laughs> this is a card for both of you. Oh, thank you. Okay, so stand right there. We'll give one, one, one other person. She's not here this morning, but Elaine Cook. Oh. We want to give her uh, appreciation because she's now she took over Bob's uh, place when he passed on. Someone had to step in and she stepped in and helping out with the finance committee. And, and so she's doing some wonderful work. We want to keep her in prayer. She's still, you know, it's been a year, but you, you, you never stop grieving at one level, you know. And so we keep her in our prayers as well. But this is a, a certificate of appreciation and a card as well. And I'll let Catherine handle that. So the, the idea here is if God had a refrigerator, and I don't know if you do it, but if you come to our house and you look on our refrigerator door, we got pictures of our family. Christmas cards, Christmas pictures, letters from some of you. They all hang on our, our door. And as we look on those, we think about it, we pray about it, and we're reminded how close and how the connections are. So if God had this refrigerator door, it's got to be a giant refrigerator door. I'm telling you. There's probably a lot of them. But your picture, both your pictures would be on the refrigerator door. And God will look at that and remember you. Always remember you. Blessings to both of you. Just a quick announcement. Um, going forward, because we're, this is our first in-person worship, and we're still doing online, so we're trying to navigate all of that. Uh, one of the things I think that we can do is print out a brief order of service, not in a bulletin form, but it might just be pages, where you can follow along with the prayer, read along with the scriptures that are being read, uh, and have a feeling of more participation in that way. Yeah, we'll send that out on the email, so you can download it, print it out, and bring it with you, and we'll try to have a couple of copies here, in case you, like I, I would probably forget, oh, I forgot my bulletin. Try not to forget it, so bring it with you, that way you, you feel like, you know, you're participating in the in the worship service until we can fully recover and get our staff back on in, in place uh, to uh, to provide all those services that you're so accustomed to. After we'll immediately following the service, and it's gonna happen real quick because I went real long today, sorry. <laughs> oh, I'm about, yes, I'm so sorry. This is an important letter, thank you. <laughs> See, I told you my brain doesn't work. <laughs> Greetings. Um, this letter is from the Puget Sound Missional District of the United Methodist Church. 
is dated the 21st of May of this year, 2021. To all the siblings at Houston United Methodist Church, grace in the peace of God, from God our Creator and Christ our Savior. I'm writing this letter to share with you that Bishop Elaine Stamp uh, Stamowski is then to, to appoint the Reverend Susan Griggs as pastor of Houston United Methodist Church effective July 1st of 2021. Pending the outcome of her interview with the Crest to Coast District Committee on Ordained Ministry. Pastor Susan is a retired local pastor in our conference who is currently serving as Chair of Diversity, Equality, sorry, Equity and Inclusion Committee of the League of Women Voters of Kitsap County as well as the Community Service and Mission Ministries Coordinator at Redeemer United Methodist Church in Kingston, Washington. Prior to her retirement in 2019, Pastor Susan had the opportunity to serve in local pastor in several of the United Methodist Churches in Connecticut and in Washington State. Feel free to announce this to the congregation beginning today, Sunday, uh, May 23rd of 2021. I also pray for God's grace and abundant blessing on our pastor, uh, Reverend Ken Macklin and his family, especially during this time of transition. Kindly join me in thanking our pastor Ken for his faithful service to the church, to the greater Tristan community. May the Holy Spirit continue to enliven in and guide your lives and ministries so you become radically welcoming and loving faithful community you are always meant to be. Your fellow disciple, Reverend J. Mark Gallum, which is our district superintendent. I will also be sending this an email um, for everyone to read as well. So, thank you, everyone. I've already had a conversation with uh, Reverend Susan. You're you're going to like her. <laughs> She's delightful. I'll be meeting her this week, but trying to transition some things so that she can hit the ground uh, flying on July. Now, June 6th, 13th. Is it will be my last Sunday in the fall, but I'll still be under appointment until the 30th, so if you have an emergency you need me, I will be available, but I'm going to take a little bit of vacation. I haven't had a vacation since COVID, I don't think, and it's just <laughs> been exhausting. Uh, people don't realize that do, doing technology the way we do it is more work than just showing up. And, I can do that, that's no problem. But all of this has been, you know, it's been a learning experience for me. Uh, it'll be a learning experience for you as we go forward, how to integrate the technology in our, our daily uh, worship experience. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit with you, and may the blessings of God Almighty, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, be with you now and forever. From my heart to your heart. So we meet again.